Hi everyone, I'm Alex and welcome back to our channel. Today we have one more episode of our series Computers of Chernobyl, a series where we explore and study the history of computers and the data processing in the Chernobyl exclusion zone. And our today hero is one of the rarest Soviet devices on this subject. It is this tiny modem. And uh, the thing is, if you watch our previous episodes, uh, specifically the Patreon version of the episode 2, where we discussed uh, the various expansion boards and special modules for the S1841 uh, x86 uh, compatible computer, uh, there you remember that actually there was such a functionality that you could connect uh, that computer to the, this kind of modem then this modem would connect to another modem, which will in its turn also be connected to a multiplexer, and the multiplexer will actually uh, make a data exchange uh, with the large YES mainframe. Uh, so, uh, if you do not remember, the YES mainframes actually was the architectural clones of uh, American IBM 360. Uh, this wine was introduced at, uh, in the end of 70s and continued actually up to the beginning of 90s. So despite that electronics uh, was very different from original, architecture was the same and uh, they were developing this one ecosystem. So this thing is actually a part of it. And uh, needless to say that pretty soon we're gonna have also um, uh, some episodes about the YES mainframes, especially because we have some hardware. For instance, recently I finished a restoration of this amazing device, which is a PL150M puncher for the paper punch tape. Uh, this was used also in a Scala, for example, with Chernobyl nuclear power plant. And this kind of stuff we will also review. So don't forget to subscribe and like so far this video. So let's do it. And just one more thing. You probably noticed that I have completely different posters behind me instead of my traditional yellow one with various dosimeters, and that actually is the thing for you. Because we recently made a poll about the merch and many of you voted for posters. So right now you already can get two of them and there will be much more. One of them is the project of Pripyat from 1968 that was never implemented, and another one is a brief history of Chernobyl with various data on contamination, about the shelter object, about the new safe confinement, about the events that happened there, and also here you can have a zone in the isometric projection, even with the terrain details and various interesting things. So link is in the description below, you can buy it online with worldwide shipping. And if you would like to have a signed version made by us straight in Ukraine and ship it from here, just write us on the Patreon and you will get it. So. This is what the device looks like. It is pretty nothing even close to what we all use it to, because it has a really huge metal tabletop case with many buttons and indicators with all the things mounted on the front panel. Well, have to say, probably pretty convenient. A model ID is 600 slash 19200 B2. Uh, there is this metal tag on the bottom as well as a writing on the front panel. So it appeared that there were many variations of this kind of modems. They looked generally similar, but had different controls and various features and purposes. Well, I tried to find some documentation for it, and so far I got just a brief technical description in one book. And that document says that this one specifically was designed for systems of automatic management and had to work in dedicated phone lines which are not connected to the automatic lines of the general use. It could provide a connectivity with a speed of 600, 12, 24, 48 and 96 hundredths bits per second and the maximum speed was kind of 19,200 uh, 19, bits per second. Well, not that bad. This very modem is a little bit different uh, than that one we described in episode 2 of the computers of Chernobyl, because there we talked about a 1200KN, which actually could work with the general purpose lines, and it had a connector for a phone as well. 
Well, this one does not, uh, which I find pretty sad, uh, because I have this amazing brand new dedicated line red phone from a similar epoch. Well, those who lived in socialistic times will immediately understand what is so special about these red phones. And for our Western viewers, I suggest to write your ideas in the comments. Otherwise, the device looks similar. Uh, well, this one has a sturdy power connector, which you normally will find on industrial equipment. But despite it has kind of three pins, uh, here it was made in a very typical way for Soviet equipment, because there is a separate screw for an earthing, which is connected to the casing. The power cord comes to the front panel, and here is also a fuse, so everything is accessible and must say pretty convenient if something. There are five control buttons, which normally use it for testing purposes. They look seriously broken, I have to say, so I don't need to check them later. So, the purpose is, uh, this KM puts the device to the self-test mode, then uh, this next one, which says touch, should send the sequence 101 during the test. Zero will send a 000 sequence. And S uh, will connect transmitter to the receiver so we can check the signal. And well, this K have no idea. The thing, however, the way of using these buttons may be device specific, so I will later try to guess how to use them properly. Then we have four LEDs numbered from 104 to 109. As I do not have a documentation for this very device, uh, you know, when we had no energy, I had some time, so I decided, to, you know, as a guess, to check the schematics of the interface board of the ES1841 computer, and there I actually found that these numbers refer to the lines of the interface, uh, which are numbered exactly this way. Then, below we have two connectors, uh, C2, which refers to Stick S2 interface for computer. Well, uh, Stick S2 is basically a socialistic version of the COM port. And C1 is for two or four wire phone line. Okay, that's it, so now let's turn it upside down and dismantle to take a look inside. I'm really curious what to expect. So, we need to remove these four screws. Uh, it's actually not so easy to remove the cover. And here we go, what is inside. Well, inside is much air, I would say. I can't say I'm surprised, but it kinda could be more compact. Here the reason is that modem has been made in a standard casing, so hence the form factor. Mm. Okay. Look at this. Uh, there is a crate with only one board. I'm not sure whether some were not removed, uh, I don't know, maybe it is not normal. Uh, okay, here is a power supply and technically that's all. Okay, now let's take a look to the board. Uh, well, this is a very good quality metal work here, I should say. Jeez, just, you know, just look at this. Boys and girls, wow. Um, you know, here I need to explain, uh, the board actually uh, looks like it would be a military production. It's a really top quality, all covered with the shiny varnish. It's really well made. Wow. 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 Well, I see here are just very simple logic chips, uh, so looks like all the functionality is to be software controlled. Wow, just look at this. Even this metal bezel was made on CNC. Everything is so precise. Like, really, it's amazing quality, head down. It's really cool. Even the casing is welded, and here we have a machined metal for this crate. Wow, that's really impressive, I have to say, for a civilian purpose electronics 
originating from the Soviet times. And you see, the crate actually is only for that one board, because at the back plane there is only one set of connectors. But uh, at the same time, here are holes for more mounts, so supposedly in other modifications it could have more boards. Oh, that's beautiful. Alright, uh, let's look to these poor buttons. Well, you know, I really do not know what can cause this kind of damage, because the inner movable part is broken to half inside and between. Uh, maybe someone just went psycho if they could not connect, I have no idea. Okay, so this is how it should be. I will now try to put a drop of uh, glue and put it back from inside as a kind of temporary solution. And as well I will glue the keycaps atop, because that part is also broken. Alright, so... Uh, that or another way I fix it, that buttons is not ideal solution, but for now is okay. Uh, they should be replaced completely later, because that's uh, probably the most awful Soviet type of switches called P2K, which are really fragile, so better to completely replace. And the next thing I wanted to try is actually to see if the uh, device is functional. So, good news, device is switching on. So you can see it. But uh, there is also one more thing. Uh, I do not have a documentation for this very modem, uh, but I have uh, it for 1200KN. And uh, there is described that uh, it has a kind of inner self-test. So I decided to try to do something by analogy, given that some buttons here are pretty matching and sockets are also pretty similar. Um, so, uh, I needed to somehow connect to this port, and here is the thing, the connector is metrical, it's, uh, it looks the same like Western, but it's a little bit wider. So, a very good thing that a couple months ago, uh, me and Mikhaila went to the Kiev electronic market. This is such a place, uh, you know, where still you can find some guys, uh, pretty old already, who sell really vintage components, which are no longer produced for a very long time. And there we got this amazing heap of the metrical connectors. They, are in fact, are fantastic, because they give amazing contact and really sturdy and really, really, really good. Uh, so I connected uh, one of the parts of it and, and then I tried to use oscilloscope and uh, voltmeter uh, just to find out something. But unfortunately, apart from getting some um, low voltage uh, when I put the modem in the so-called loop mode, I didn't get anything matching what was described in the existing documentation. But I decided to go a little bit different way and started to probe uh, the pins of the connector and uh, according to the schematics of the port. And eventually I could trigger some sockets and uh, make the LEDs react. So I would say that device actually is working, that or another way. Uh, the next step will be to connect it to actual YES computer. But here I will need to try to somehow find the corresponding connector for the interface board, uh, because YES has used, um, if it is civilian YES 1841, it uses this uh, strange, uh, nearly proprietary connectors, which is impossible to find. So uh, that moment we'll do it. And then we'll try to use the teletext program, uh, which we already show in a in fifth episode, very briefly, it's a basically CPM application, specifically for communicating uh, through these modems to the uh, big mainframes. So all of that, if you will succeed, will be on the Patreon, so don't forget to join us there. And in the meanwhile, like this video, subscribe to our channel, and get ready for the new episodes of Computers of Chernobyl and various interesting Chernobyl insights on this channel. So, see you next time.